Many Faces of Cashel is a project that means an awful lot to me personally. It's a project I'm extremely proud of. I know it means a lot to an awful lot of people. The Facebook group has grown way more than I could have ever imagined and has become a great platform for Cashel people all over the world to keep in touch with one another. Or for a quiet moment to look back and reminisce on times, events and people long gone by. Don't take the books off the shelves that often anymore. When I do I get a sense of great achievement. Read stories, see people I'd forgotten. Sadly hear the voices of all those who feature in the book who are no longer with us. With that, there is regret. Regret I never video recorded our interviews. It would have been a real treat to look back at. I felt at the time that people being recorded would take the intimacy out of our chats over countless cups of teas and biscuits. People would be more conscious of the way they looked on film and may be less likely to open up. Even though I have regret, I still feel it was the right thing to do at the time. But thankfully, I've been left with over a hundred hours of audio from those interviews. I always wondered what I'd do with it. Until now. Thankfully, lots of those in the book are still alive and with us. But for the families of those who are not, I'm fully aware it may stir up emotions of sadness. But I hope that hearing the voices of those loved ones will invoke happy memories. As we become more aware of the passing of time, one by one the faces disappear. That's how life has always been. There is no time like the present to record those memories before one by one the stories are gone. These are their stories. Cashel's stories. Our stories. What is your earliest memory? What's your uh, earliest memory? The earliest memory is 1929. I, um, John McCormack was singing on the Rocky Castle. Yes. The centenary the of, of, centenary yeah. of um, Catholic Emancipation. Emancipation, yeah. And uh, somebody was in to mind us, and we were warned. And the father and mother were invited up. Yes. And we we were warned not to leave the place okay, inside the gate. I mean, the garden was big enough, but of course I made off on my own, got out, and was heading up to the rock. Until Danny there was in the schoolyard, saw me and caught me in the purple pack of those days. I was born in Borhertlock in Cashel and I was reared there and actually it was a great street in, in, uh, in my youth. We were able to play on the street. We used to play rounders, it was a great thing and everybody used to take part. The McDonald's were great, if we had Gussie on one side we'd have Nancy on the other team and it was great and everybody played and we were very lucky on that street. There were no cars much in that time, in our early days. Yeah. But then of course the cars came along and we were lucky enough that um, my father worked in Corby's and uh, we were always welcoming Corby's. We went in there, we all, all of us spent our youth in there. We saw an awful lot of things. There was the horses and they hunted and it was really like upstairs, downstairs in yes. those days. And uh, the cocktail parties and the bridge parties in the daytime and 
as I say, they just go to the hunt and they, when they come back from the hunt, all the work that had to be done with the washing and the cleaning of the horses. My father was the groom there. Okay. <clears throat> and it was the horses he always looked after. And she kept two, there was always two horses because he'd ride one to the hunt and bring the other one and then she'd hunt with the other one. You were saying she was she was sitting on a, she a side used saddle. hunt side saddle. Side saddle. Yeah. She always had uh, servants there, like, okay. and as I said, it was really, in the upstairs. early days now, it was really upstairs, downstairs, okay. and they had uh, two uniforms. They had a uniform for downstairs, and they had a uniform for when they'd be upstairs. Okay. Indeville was built around 1820. Sometime in the late 1800s, the Corby family bought the house. In 1883, Miss Ethel Corby was born an only child to John and Margaret Corby. She lived a privileged life behind the gates of Indeville. She died in 1983, a few weeks short of her 100th birthday. I was born in St. Patrick's Hospital in Cashel, 1948, the 7th of December. Um, that was where the maternity ward was then. And the day that I was taken away out of that hospital, I think they offered up a novena because nobody slept in the hospital while I was there. Um, I was roaring and bawling and screeching, wouldn't stop. And that was a trend that I had for my young baby days. Um, even in the church when I was getting baptised, there was five being baptised the same day, and I was the only one row. But I had a terrible strong pair of lungs. Maybe that's why I became a trumpet player after, I don't know. But I was born there and uh, lived in in Eagles Lane here. But there was no water here, there was no sewage here, there was very, it was very badly run down. And I can remember being in this room with the stone walls, and you'd see a rat popping his head out of the wall now and again. Oh yeah, they were running through to get the, the stone walls like. They used to talk about the good old days and um, all the things we did then that, we, that isn't being done now. I remember we had hoops, wheels of bicycles and have a stick and... But then of course there wasn't so much traffic. Okay. And, uh, and we used to play them up and down the road. Up and down the road, and we had tops and whips and skipping ropes. And um, I know I think about the children had a better idea of how to enjoy themselves than they have now. Then, of course, they hadn't the technology that they have now, and that's not all to scratch up to be. I suppose we'll start off then. When and where were you born, Marjorie? I was born in Hill House. In Hill House. Palmer's Hill. And Mrs. Rouse was the nurse. Why my mother had to go there for me to be born, I don't know. But anyway, that's where I was born. On the 8th of March, 1931. Oh, I came first and uh, Michael came second. And after that, there was no more. Yes. For what reason, I don't know. Mrs. Rouse and her daughter was a um, public health nurse as well. She used to have a um, bag at the back of her bicycle and going out for a spin, going out to see a patient. And I always thought that she had the baby in, in, the, in the back of the bag, in the car, and the, whatever they called. Everyone had to, 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 to Phillips well at that time listen to the whole match when they started first and we all listened to it and then we'd listen to the boxing especially our, our, our favourite boxer Joe, Joe Lewis the brown bomber we used to listen at half three in the morning we'd wait up all, all night for him We often brought the house into here into the kitchen yeah the house is, my father was, was, was used to buy and sell and uh, that's why the back place is open but I remember Mrs. Fitzgerald next door, she could be, she could talk and knit and count the knit and count the stitches. 
at the same time talking to me mother got over the fence. They'd be talking away and she'd be knitting and counting the stitches. My hands would be going. That was Mary Fitzell, was it? I remember Johnny's all the trophies Johnny used to have in there. Yeah. Oh, we used to be in the room inside until it was 14. Johnny Fitzell won the cross country one time with a broken toe. Over the road, cross country. I met Danny McDade above in, in Donegal. Danny, the man with the cap, was the one for Donegal. And I said to him, Did you don't know a man by the name of Johnny Vassell? He said to me, Johnny Vassell trained me for the Olympics. Were there any street games you used to play in? What used to play on the streets? Well, oh, I used to play the cricket with the, the tin, the, 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 the lid of a, of a, of a battle. There was a stump yeah. round us. Four was into the garden. Six were over the house. Right. And one of you broke a window. <laughs> My father, first of all, was a Dublin man. He smuggled his way down in the back of a lorry down from Dublin. We were coming down with Carl. At the age of 21, then he met up with my mother, Lizzie Kane, from Cashel. So they met up together and they went out for a few years then and got married. And when they got a house then over in the Greens, we lived in the. Uh, at least I wasn't born then, but all the lads, there was uh, elder brothers, like, and one sister at the time. And uh, we were there for a while anyhow, and the next thing, I was the last. I was only 12 months old, and there were hard times, and uh, there was a certain man not mentioning his name at the time that wanted to put his aunt into the house. And uh, the bailiffs came without any notification whatsoever and evicted the family and put them out onto the side of the street. There was a lovely gentleman, da- a gentleman then that had a house next to it there by the name of Patrick English. But when we were evicted and put out, there was a bit of a hole of blue at the time, anyhow, and Pack was the first to come and he said that he'd give the land if we could get the timber or whatever it was. So the father was working. Uh, in the old infirmary, they were knocking the old infirmary or going about to build the new hospital at the time. Uh, all the men who was there working, they got together with all their planks and galvanised and what have you, and uh, they hit for the hill up the old county home boreen, it was called then, like. Deer Park now, is it? And it's called Deer Park now. He gave the land there then, and all the men got together with the and they went up to the place and with their galvanised and built an old shack. And they were able to come up there and get the family off the road and put them in there within a few hours. There was no uh, concrete on the floor, it was only on the grass. From walking on it, they'd better it down to, to a good hardy floor, like after a couple of years maybe in it. But uh, yes, it was uh, finished up that it was a lovely little shack in the finish. The only regrets that I have is we never had a photograph of it. Okay. To show it to people. So that's, that's the only regrets that I have. It was a very uh, friendly town with caring people and wonderful neighbours. Davy Cocker, do you remember when? Davy was the town sergeant, was the he? The town Jack? sergeant, that's right. right. And Davy was a dog with that size. We used to be terrified of Davy. We used to be playing hammer up against something at the wall. Right. And uh, even they'll take down the road traffic and the roads then. Yeah. And Davy, some say, here's Davy Cocker, we would all fly. He's, we'd chase him. And he set the dogs after us. We used to be terrified. Right. We always thought Davy Cocker come, we'd run a mile. 
November 1937 to Prairie Medical Kelly and the Bachelor Clare Clary. Don't build the queues extend, the double the old queues extend, and the matches to follow was played in Clary. The Prairie won by 3.11 to 3 points. And after the ma- 8 o'clock mass in Cashel, Jackie Darrigan came up to me, Jackie dead now, of course. Yeah. We, I would have been, Jackie was the same age as me, so we would have been 12 years of age at the time. And we were up to Holland Field, and we were poked around the ball up there. And we came down about half 11 anyway, and tossed a stand at the pumps. Where are we? Where are we? We're looking at a place for you. My father's gone down to Killarney with my mother and he was we waiting to bring the two of you down. So we started to cry. <laughs> so they were going bringing you to the match, weren't they? Well, we were bringing us to the match, but he couldn't wait. He went off and down, as you see. And we nearly died. And I remember the first day I saw a woman smoking in the streets. I nearly collapsed. That was Molly Watson right. from Longfield. And the Lord of Mercy, she was a fine woman. And she did no coil steps. Yes, absolutely. But she yeah. was sitting on coil steps, she smoked a cigarette. I nearly died when I saw her. I played I love the hole and I did on football. But I loved the hole and the hole was the main game then. The way the the football wasn't as well, in as it is now in them days, it was all holding. Well, but it's stone, stone down the stone here. There was the goalposts. Oh, we used to play games and simply the rock playing the green and the rock playing Abbey side up the top of the road. The green playing, and I playing the rock, the green playing board lock, different places, they all had their own teams. Yeah, and we used to play them. I'm some good games. And we were young fellas now. We used to always play hurling across the road there. At, we called it Barrington's Gate. Barrington's Gate was the name of it. And we how we made the ball was um, with, the, with the nationalist, when everyone had it read, we, we uh, tied we tied it up and folded it up, tied it with and real tight and made a ball out of it. And we huddled right across there every day of the week. It wasn't a car on the street at the time. And we had some fun. That was many, many moons ago. But let me tell you, we had some enjoyment out of it. You know, I suppose the old times are tough, like raising a family at 12. Had to be hard work and that. But the only thing about it was it made uh, people industrious, like, you know, we had a, a big, big garden which we tilled from the back door, you could say, up to the the ditch at Damardy's. And that was a, a big, big plot. And that was our shores when we got home from school and that, you know. And we always kept greyhounds and dogs and washing out from them and walking them and training them and that with little enough success at times too, I might as well tell you. And that, but uh, I suppose, you know, it was part of the course at that time. Everybody else was doing much the same. And of course, kept a few pigs then as well and fattened them. And I suppose that uh, supplemented the income some little bit and helped with the rearing of the, the flock and that. and. Most houses at that particular time, we say, they either kept a few chickens. You get the old chicks at the time, and they come in in the bus. And you go down to the bus, and you bring them home in a smart little box, and you rear them up. Now, lots of houses at that time rear them, and it happened then when they grew up. They 
go into bullets and you had the egg and you had the hen and eventually you start killing them off, we say, you know, and uh, boil them and People roast were very self-sufficient then. Absolutely. Then, and then they had their own spuds out of the garden and we say you pissed them then and you had them over the winter, like, you know. They were entrepreneurial enough, like with the fattening of an old pig and that, you know, you buy the few bonnets and... Of course, at that time, there's no radio, no television. Um, very few people had, if you like, what they have today in the sense of the walk. But um, we, 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 we were all for one and all for one and one for all. And and, and the neighbours were the same. If you if you were stuck, you you know you could ask the neighbour. They'd, they'd come and ask you. They'd ask you, do you want something like? It? you stuck for anything and they'd, they'd help you out and it was a wonderful, wonderful uh, camaraderie, a wonderful, wonderful neighbourhood, you know. Uh, and um, they were tough times. Uh. We lived in the Camus Road and an old house belonged to Dixon Connors, at least he claimed it even though he didn't own it. But that's which sort of part of the Hale Estate. Now we moved from a house in San Mel where you had a gas light, you had an indoor toilet and a bathroom, you had running water, hot and cold, and we moved into a hut, you might say, a house with a mud floor, no lights, no water and no toilet. It was pure purgatory on my poor mother, a mud floor, can you picture that? In, in 1940, it's hard to believe, but that was a fact. Now, there was an old hole in the yard, actually. That was just only a hole, and it was going into the sewage. And that's where we used to <laughs> go to the toilet and so forth. But uh, the rats could talk to you there. There was, it's unbelievable the amount of rats were there. But every August, when you get what was known as the August flood, or in other words, a heavy rain had come, and we'd be flooded out. And there'd often be two foot of water in the house. So up to the home with the whole lot of us then for a week or a fortnight until the flood went and back. And the picture come back into a house, a mud floor, and after the flood been in it for a fortnight, it was pure purgatory. I don't know how my poor mother stuck it. But eventually we got a house who lived in it before us was the Dutch Lukeman's parents and the Dutch of Oban McCann Street and we thought we were in heaven, because there was a toilet there, there was electric lights, and there was water. We were kids, like, living in the lower gate. At this stage now, we'll be about eight or nine years of age, maybe. Yeah, eight or nine years of age. 1947. We were more, we were 11, we were 11. Anyway. It was a very wicked bad year, 1947, and we rolled a snowball down by the post office. As kids, now there was a gang of us in the ten or twelve of us in it, and we rolled it down to the fountain, and then we rolled it down the hill. We didn't have to roll it down the hill because it ran away from us. And it was down at the corner of the Golden Road, where P. Fitzell lives now, young Fitzell lives there, right? And the snowball was in the middle of the road, and believe it or believe it not, in the month of June, the council broke it up with pickaxe and so forth. And that was 1947. But they were talking about 1963, it wasn't anybody else as bad as 47. Well, my earliest memories of the castle would be when they used to hold the turkey baskets. That's yeah. a long time ago. Uh, on the 8th of December, there'd be turkeys brought in and sold on the street. And it used to be nice that time to, to go in and you could buy a turkey on the street instead of going into the shops. You know, it was, it was good to go back on them years. Cut the doors up from him, they had another shop, the Bibloraini. And when we were going to school, 
the people I'd have be able to chuck the salt in the window. Uh, chuck the bears a penny. Okay. And we used to win to torment him. And we said, Mitch, I must have the penny bears in the window. <laughs> How'd people put us play? And so to be written on it, chuck the bears a penny. School then, Nanny, school, where did you school, go to school? School, went to school then in Mokler's Hill. And um, sure, half the time we went in our bare feet because we hadn't to shoot too well. And um, we'd have a bit of our little bit of lunch. They'd done the best they could for us. So my bit of lunch, our bit of lunch, maybe with a, bit of, a couple of cuts of bread and to be dry and to be wrapped up in a bit of newspaper. <laughs> and by the time lunchtime would come, we had it eaten because we were so hungry. And if we wanted a drink then, we had to go across the road. There was a, a tap, a big, we called it a pump, that you p press on the handle and the water would come out and you put your mouth underneath it for to get a drink. So um, we'd be happy with that. Then we'd be coming home from school in the evenings and we'd think we'd never get home. And we used to go into the fields long gone. You'd get the turnips, you know, the young, and we'd bring them out onto the road and we'd break them off of the road and we'd be eating them because these be lovely and sweet when they be raw. And that's what we do when we get home. And my mother then should have a big pot of porridge made. And uh, we'd be delighted to have a bowl of that, but there was no milk or no sugar in it. And that's, she'd done the best she could and gave us what she could, I thought. So. But the classrooms, like Frank Egan um, was a naturalist, right? I mean, we, we were, schooled on things like when he'd be digging the garden and he was into that kind of stuff, his little garden below, which is now Fowley's garden, at the Fowley's thing at the back of the house there. And vivid memories to this day of what he'd be digging. And the robin, when he'd, he'd, he'd stop for a break, or maybe to weed something, and the robin would land on top of the, the fork and did be a worm and he'd throw out the worm and the robin had hopped down beside him. Uh, he was obviously, an awful lot of, of, of teachers at that time would have been sort of Gael Gorey and would have been aligned to Fianna Fáil, right? Yeah. But if you were the blue shirt, you read the Irish Independent and the Evening Herald. If you were of the Fianna Fáil persuasion, you read the Irish Press and the Evening Press, right? And in one of the papers, I don't know, I think it was the Evening Press on a Tuesday evening, J. Austin Freeman wrote a column. You might even get it if you Google it, yeah. right? But he used to have a story, Brock the Badger. And we got that book and he'd read that out to us, to what Brock was up to. And all there used to be a little, J. Austin Freeman then used to write a kind of a nature thing about fishing and birds and all that kind of stuff. But Frank had a press, which is still there. The press is still there. On, as you walk into the scout hall, it's there on the right hand side in the big room, and in and that was a basket, and he had two swan's eggs. Now swan's eggs are quite big. The middles were sucked. In, like uh, if you bust open a swan's egg that was gone off to stink the planet, yeah. but you could suck the middle. You could when it was fresh, you put a little hole in it, and a little small. It could be only a straw. You could suck, siphon, siphon the, in. And then all you had, and they, I think they put something stuff into it so that it wouldn't actually collapse, right? But he had those, and those were the crown jewels, right? Um, inside in this little thing, and if you were good, you got to see these eggs. two little swan's eggs. With the result that, in my case, 60 years on, I would, well, maybe I would have been six when I was in that class, right? Like, if I went to put coal on the fire and there was a, a spider or a snail or them little creepy crawly little wood lice inside them, I'd pick them out and put them out on the windowsill. Yeah. They wouldn't go into the fire, right? I would put that down to a legacy of Frank Egan, right? 11, 
to come up to the old brother's school, they've knocked that down now. And it was me and Connie Dye, and we were kicked out of it at, at 13 and a half. We were carrying on, and we had catapults, and we were shooting hot crusts of bread and all of one another. Anyway, it was a brother tying in for the Christian brothers there now, that they weren't there then. And uh, he was a bad tempered and all, youngish bro. And he can't learn it. He warned his mind, first of all. And the next thing was, uh, we were still trying to do it behind his back. And <laughs> he'd seen us. And he came up and he caught at me in the back of the neck, maybe the back of the neck, and straight down the stairs he threw us. And uh, there was a wide stairway. The bouncer used to come up the middle. He went down one side and come up the other side. And uh, Connie died, he threw Connie died. <laughs> no, yeah. yeah. We came home anyway and I was telling my mother. And anyway, she said, that's it. You're not going back to school anymore. And then my father come in. Oh, why? Right, not finished schooling yet. She says he's not going back to that school anymore. And I went out to work. School and then I went suppose. to school at four and a half. Very hard to settle in. Children have so much going for them now. Yeah. So much. And rightly so. Um, I hated being with the nuns. And even as a young, that young age, I knew there was discrimination between one lot of us and another lot of us. In 1937, when I first went to school in Kessel, and of course the, the school was the old school up on the old Dublin Road, just at the top of the hill. Uh, and uh, my first sight of Kessel every morning for the number of years that I went in there, we were still in the, we continued there for about two years before we went down in 1939 to the Golden Road. And of course, the first sight of Cashel every morn for that two years or three was going up the kill and all the little houses. There was one continuous, uh, one after another. It was a big, old, dilapidated building, as I said in the poem, reaching up to heaven, reaching up to heaven in the shadow of the rock. Now, it was reaching up to heaven, but it was barely standing because it was an old, dilapidated building. It had originally been a three-story and there was a fourth because there was a basement to it. It wasn't used at all. But I remember when I started going into Cashel, it just show you the, how, how deprived the people were. There was a, 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 a woman with a son, Mrs. Cashel, I remember the name, and she lived down in the basement in a little, in, went in in the basement, it was a dark little place and she had a couple of rooms in there. And Mrs. So she lived in the basement. In the so. basement. And uh, it was, uh, there were three stories up over that. But when I went in there, the top story, because of it, uh, it must fall into despair, the top story had been taken out. And there were only there were only three teachers in the secondary school. There was the, 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 the um, what do they call it? The superior. The, he was a brother Carew. He was a Ross Moore man. He was a tough man. We used to call him the boom. And the boob, when you'd go a line, he'd just look you in the eye and he'd say, left hand, poor man. And you had to point the left hand right to his heart. And I tell you, after six, seven, you knew where you were. And I went to Selbridge, County Cadair, to the boarding school. Did you like it? Did you like boarding? Yes, yes. <laughs> just so far, I'll be honest with you. Yes, it was fun. It was ridiculous, from West Cork, yeah. right up to Kildare. I went in in September and I never got home until Christmas and no such thing as visiting. Okay. I never saw my parents and I had um, a, a letter a week, that's what we got. She was like the comments. Uh, the regime of all the brothers at that time was strictness. Okay. They couldn't let their hair down. To, con to talk to you like an ordinary person. They were on one side, to be on the very rare occasion. 
and you were the you were the pupil going in, and they were sitting behind the large desk, and you'd be with all the boys then looking up at them. But a major event then was going from the National School, and after spent four years up there, you were marched down to the CBS on the Golden Road. It was like a military operation. Frank would be out in front, clay das, clay das. We'd be marching out like if we were going to Vietnam or something. And we were, it's like what they did. It's a small town, as you know, but it's like going to a different world. Down the green, sharp right at the top of board clock, left onto the Golden Road and in. And of course, it was like a... It was nearly a shock to the system, yet with great anticipation we were going to a bigger school and there was men there with, well not Roman colours, the Christian brothers and there was very few lay teachers there that time. So then in the primary there you did from third to sixth. And I must say I, I had very nice teachers there. You know, you often hear people giving out about the Christian brothers. I can only really talk from personal experience. I never saw anything much out of the way with them. They gave me a great love of things native and you know, culture and sport. And they were very good teachers, they were very committed men, you know. Now I dare say down, like every place, there was not a bad one, but I didn't encounter them. And I'm only prepared to talk about the people I knew. It was a September day in 1939. We had changed down to the Golden, Golden Road. Road. And on this particular day that I'm talking about, I don't know who was with me, we took a bit of a stroll, I don't know whether we were allowed or we do, it was an exit or something, but anyway, we took a bit of a walk up the street. And as we were passing back, past the bank, to what was then Miss Hennigan's house, wasn't it was a private house, and wasn't the window of what looked like a sitting room, wasn't it open, and a radio was playing inside. Now, there was no television then, but, and there were few enough radios. So we were realised that that was the first, one of the first times we ever heard the voice out of a radio. And we stopped to listen. And what did we hear? An announcement on the one o'clock news from Radio Air announcing that the Second World War had just begun. In to the 1st of September, 19... 39, the day the war broke out, the Hitler invaded Danzig, and I went up to Jungle Grass of Friar Street for eggs for my father. And Willie did Hissel, you know Willie did I do remember. Willie remember was coming down Willie. Friar Street and he shouted at somebody, The war is on. And of course, there was no television at that time until like then. And the Germans had to go into Danzig. And that was the first Sunday, the first Friday. It was a beautiful sunny day, I can still see it. Yeah. And a lovely sunny day. And... I can still see Dean Tarbert coming up John Street. They come up the middle of John Street uh, and, and Minister Brock. Charlie Hawkins was, was caretaker and bellringer. Uh, up in the in, in the cathedral, and the thing for, for for at eleven o'clock, and you could see all the uh, the, the the Church of Ireland people coming up John Street. I can remember that. They'd come, you'd see, and they walk in the middle of the road. There were some great characters in Cashel. We had a fella called uh, he 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 was a, a fella called Paddy the Rat. He was a, a vagrant, and he he beat himself with a stick. And we were all afraid of him as young fellas. And he'd come in, the feathers rolled the climb and rolled, he'd have a stick, and he'd beat himself in the back. And then there was John O'Darrigan in the back of the pipes. And he 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 had a stick, a round stick, and he a, a, a bicycle bell, and he'd ring and he split his leg again. <laughs> and he'd ring the bell. <laughs> oh Jesus. There were some great characters in Cashin. His nickname was Johnny Malone, your legs. And by Jesus, I tell you, you won't have to be on the move if you call them that. Because <laughs> <laughs> you got to kick up the bloody ass. <laughs> that was a great long, long time ago. Many of the kicking the ass I got from fellas. Uh, if we had the fire siren going, um, we'd fly out up 
I know Piazza Fry Street where Paki Lahi had the shop next to Fry Street Fuels and all the kids would be up to talk about health and safety just to see the engine going out and it might go up the way or go down the way but I remember one particular day the fire siren went and it was a fair day in Cashel and we ran out the gate the old gate that was there because the old gate was a heavier gate it was set back about two foot I don't know is it even still inside the other one but it was set back and when we went out I can remember we didn't go any further because Ryan's Hotel was on fire and it was just across the road like and it was burning on the three floors the flames were bellowing out the three floors and luckily enough there was never any, there wasn't anybody killed or injured or anything but seemingly something exploded and went straight up to the two floors like in a ball of fire but Tommy O'Connor the Dell as he was called he was working somewhere in the vicinity of Friar Street now he wasn't in the fire brigade but he had ladders up and that but there was two girls working there. Now, they weren't in an immediate danger. They were above at Merton or the wire's end of it. But they were froze. And they weren't going to come down. And to see ran in and brought the two of them down. Don't know who they were, but they were working in the hotel. And I remember the, the Merton the wire's shop now as we know it. That is an original piece of the hotel. They saved that piece. And it was merely... Butler, Mary Fitzpatrick, he's, he's her father that saved that. I can see him going up the ladder. Now, they had no cherry picking things mm. or anything like that at that time. It was a case of going up on a ladder and trying to bring up the hose. And I can see him above with a leg on both sides of that ridge with the slates, and he cut all the slates up and on with a hatchet. There's, there's a gable there, you see. And he's sitting above, and the whole roof was collapsed in, and he hosing away like that above. And a leg, and not a bother on him. But what they were afraid of that day was uh, Darrigan's petrol pumps at the other end. If they got a spark on that, the whole street was gone. And of course, the houses weren't in the best of condition from there up. And if they caught fire, Dick Dossies, the whole lot was gone, right up to Josie Ryan. They'd have gone up like in a tinderbox. 